Hi, this is Mike Chupka from Power Options, and welcome to Credit Spreads Beyond the Basics Part 1. I want to look at a little bit in today's presentation is what can we expect with credit spreads? Are our expectations realistic? How much should we consider to invest with spread trades? Is the stock important? Is it best to have a higher return? Is it best to have a lower strike difference? And what should we look for to apply credit spreads into our portfolio? Now, last week I shared with you credit spreads the basics. You can view that archive at any time at the Power Options Archive webinar page under the Options Strategies category or on the Power Options YouTube page. In that presentation, we covered just the basics of the straightforward structure of a bull put credit spread and a bear call credit spread, potential outcomes of those positions, basics of risk versus reward on the different structures of the credit spreads themselves, a brief comparison of higher return versus higher probability, and a little on strike price selection. Now, in this presentation, I want to move beyond the basics. Today, I want to look at applying spread strategies in your portfolio with a focus more on what is possible and is it realistic. We want to look at position sizing and we want to take a look at what do we need? Do we need a higher return to be successful with our spread trades? Do we need a higher probability to be successful with our spread trades? Do we need a specific strike difference or not? Without going too in depth into a lot of the different terminology, but we are going to look at some of the more important terminology as well. You can be successful at spread trading. A lot of investors have use spread trades in their portfolio with a portion of their portfolio to be successful. But there are investors who have lost a lot of money based on the structure in the spread trade and not having realistic expectations. Now, when we look at a credit spreads, most credit spread traders want to be out of the money. For a bull put credit spread, they want to be below the stock price. And for a bear call, they want to be above to have the better chance that the stock will stay the same, move up or down slightly, or go in their desired direction so they can essentially profit in three different directions. Of course, if it goes the wrong direction, we could have large losses, and we are going to take a look at that. What would we consider a good probability? What is this term probability? Well, a theoretical probability is based on the past trading range of the stock. We take a look at those values, and we essentially apply the standard deviation to get a bell curve. Based on that curve, we can calculate the likelihood that the stock will be trading at or above a certain strike price in the next 10, 20, 30 days or more, what your expiration cycle is. Now, most investors want to start off with at least a 70% probability or higher. This may roughly translate to saying that the short option delta, the option that you're selling in the credit spread, will have a delta of less than 0.3 or greater than negative 0.3 if you're looking at puts. But we're looking at 0.3 or lower for an absolute value. And of course, we want to find stocks following the trend. If I'm doing a bull put spread, yes, I'm going out of the money so the stock can stay the same or move down slightly. But I want to look for stocks that are moving in the desired direction of the spread. Same with bear call credit spreads. If we use the Power Options tools and ran a search for bullish positions, bull put credit spreads, that expired, let's say, in 30 days, and were in that 70 to 75% probability range, the top three results we'd see are Clovis, Canopy Growth, and Tandem Diabetes. We see that all of these spreads are out of the money. In this case, the net credit is around 50 to 60 cents for a one month trade. And we see an average return of about 36% or so. Okay. Now let's assume we entered these three trades. 
and we did this same structure month by month in our portfolio. Seven out of 10 times we were right and made the maximum profit at an average of 36%. You see the probability there, the average probability is 72.3%. The stocks would be above our short put strike prices at expiration. Now, if I'm taking a 36% return, I really have an average of only about a three and a half to one risk reward ratio, three to one or four to one. So if I do take the full loss on one of these spreads, it might wipe out three to four previous trades. Now, every month I enter these three trades, we're right about 70% of the time, make 36% return when we're right. But because we're not that far out of the money on these positions, we do have a high probability, but it's not extraordinarily high. If a stock moves against us suddenly, we may be able to stop and get out, not with the full loss, but let's say a 75% loss on the investment. Meaning, on the first trade here for Clovis, we're selling the 19 put and buying the 17. I take in a 55 cent net credit on a two point spread. That means I have a dollar 45 total at risk. The stock falls suddenly and it drops to let's say 18 to maybe 1750. I may take close to a dollar 10 or a dollar 20 risk to liquidate the position before I take the full loss. So that's close to the 75% loss. Now, what would we expect? Let's take a look at the Trade Simulator tool. You can find this at RadioactiveTrading.com and click on the Resources tab. We're going to put in our inputs. I'm going to expect to make 36% when I'm right. I'm going to cut the losses to only 75% when I'm wrong. I'm only going to expect to be wrong around 30% of the time with my 70% probability. I'm going to take $10,000 as a starting amount and I'm going to allocate a third of that $10,000 to each position. Simulating, if I took $10,000 allocated to spreads, taking the top three, I divest the money into a third for each position. All right, what would we expect? Naturally, we expect to win, and we could. This simulation shows the return over 100 trades. We flip a coin 100 times. Heads, we make 36%. Tails, we lose the 75% of that investment into the spread. This simulation here shows us that we could have a 67% return. We started with $10,000, and after 100 trades, we have 16773 we were right 73% of the time. We got the win ratio we wanted, but look at the wild swings. At one point, this account was more than triple. It had a high value of $33,386. But at one point, strings of winners and losers, it actually dropped down to a value of only 1326 It's an 87% loss on the 10000 we started out with. So over 100 trades, we have a 67% return. If I opened three trades per month, as we saw with a 30-day time period to expiration, that would be 36 trades per year. So in just under three years, we'd be averaging about 22.2% per year. But we needed the 73% win ratio to succeed. If you take those same numbers, 36% return, loss of 75% on the investment, $10,000 allocated, only a 30% chance of loss and looking for a 70% success rate. If we were right only 66% of the time, just a little bit under the 73% we saw, we're at a drastic loss. With the win-loss ratio, the account only reached a high value of 13000 Well, that's still a 30% return. But over time, we almost go bankrupt, and we end up with about a 90% loss. This 70% success rate and 36% return with a 75% loss into the spread 
it's not profitable at 70% success rate, 71%, and it's essentially just a little bit below break even if you were right 72% of the time. And that is the nature of spread trades and why some investors haven't been successful. There's a lot of services out there that quote that you can make 15 to 20% every week on credit spreads. You can make 40% per month using credit spreads because of the leverage. But they don't teach it properly so that even though you're looking for something with a reasonable probability, even if you hit your target, 72, 72.4% success, you're just about break even. Anything even slightly below that, you're not making money. So to be successful, what needs to change? A few things, to be honest. Trades can be managed, but losses should be lower. Why did I use an expectation of a 75% loss on spreads? Because in the market shifts we saw in 2018, those sudden movements can cause the stock to quickly drop between or below both strike prices, putting you sometimes at a 90 to 95% loss when you wake up in the morning when the day before you were still out of the money or it's between the strikes and you're looking at a 65 to 70% loss if you liquidated at that time. So losses should be lower, but a lot of times it's gonna break through your management before you can adjust it. Now we should increase the probability. That's gonna lower the return, but it's also going to increase our success rate. Will it pay off? Another important thing is on position sizing. And we're going to talk about that in a moment, too. Now, let's try it again, looking at what would happen if we ran in that same search but forced positions to have an 80 to 85% probability instead of 70 to 75%. What would we see? Well, we have some similar stocks here. Canopy again, Tandem Diabetes. These are the top three trades one month out in time with that greater than 80% probability. The average return lowers to about 19%. Now that's still a 5 to 1 to 6 to 1 risk reward ratio. But let's assume we're right 8 out of 10 times. And with this outcome, the average probability of the top three is 81.8%. And let's assume that when we're wrong, because we went further out of the money and gave ourselves a deeper cushion, that if we are wrong, we only take a 65% loss on the investment instead of 75 because we're further out of the money. What would we see? We lower our target return to only 19%. Going further out of the money, so we lower our loss on a trade that goes against us to an average of 65% but we're only gonna be wrong 20% of the time. Take that same $10,000, allocate 33% of that to each trade. Flip a coin 100 times, what do we get? Well, at the target of 80% winners, only 20% losers, we almost double our money. We do double the money at one point, taking the 10,000 up to 23,000 with strings of winners in a row but we also get down to a loss of almost 33% at one point with the strings of winners and losers. And we end up, let's be honest, just a little bit above break even. And that's the simulation of being right 80% of the time. Where would I hit my goals? In theory, right at the mark of the results that we saw in the search. Remember that average we were looking for, the average probability was 81.8%. Here the simulation shows us a drawdown of only 30% at one point and an ending of 100 trades at about 18,980, an 89% return. Now remember, these were one month trades. So if we opened 36 trades per year in just about three years, 
we took in 89 to 90%, that's an average of about 29.9% per year with the success rate of about 82%. Lower return, only 19% target instead of 36. Control of the losses because we were further out of the money. There's still a wild swing there. We still see a swing almost up to $45,000 from 10,000 and down essentially below 7,000, a 30% loss from the $10,000 starting point. This is what I think is reasonable. For credit spreads, even if you're doing weeklies, getting a lower net credit up front, you're still allocating the same amount of capital. You increase naturally the number of commissions per trade because you're doing them every week instead of a few every month. But if you're looking at weekly, going two weeks out, monthly, I think 25 to 35% per year on that portion of your spread trade portfolio should be the expectation. Losses will occur and they will be large at times, even if you're using a stop, even if you're using a trigger. Sometimes you won't be able to avoid it. There will be positions you will end up taking close to a 100% loss. Is it likely to get 25 to 35% per year? Can it be done? And could it have happened last year? Here we look at just the basic chart of SPY over 2018. Could any spread trade been successful? And we're talking credit spread trade here during this mess. If you look at it month by month, six out of the 12 months of 2018 were negative market performance. With just looking at this, that implies a 50% win-loss ratio if you're doing bull spreads or bear spreads. And we say, oh, but we're going 5%, 8% out of the money. We're looking for a 75, 80, 85% probability. Well, when the reverses occurred, February 5th through 9th, after a day and a half, you were probably blown through both strike prices of your bull put thread, even starting out one month out in time, two weeks out in time, especially one week out in time, with an 80 to 85% probability. It just blew right through it. Maybe the end of June cycle wasn't as bad, but the first few days in October middle days of November and the first few days of December and going forward because you get those steep losses and when you do win you make a fair percentage but it's capped right so what do we talk about capped wins and steep losses when you do lose we saw we're losing to that tune of six to one to nine to one risk reward ratios so how could anything be successful believe it or not it was very possible to hit the targets and be successful with spread trading. And believe it or not, it was in bull puts, not really bear calls. A bull put approach could have seen a 50% return in 2018, even with the disastrous months of October, November, and December. Using shorter term, two week out trades could have seen a success rate of about 88%, 74 trades over the course of a 12-month period, 65 wins and only nine losses, with an average of about a 15.1% gain on the winners. That 19% we saw was for 30-day positions with that 85% probability. And on those nine losses, taking an average of an 88% loss, which is much higher than the 65%, which is our target. These are the results of the bull put weekly search we show on power options if we started positions on January 1st, 2018 and ran them through December 29th before the start of 2019. One of our featured additional products is the strategy testing tool. So we simulated an account of $100,000. We took the top three results every two weeks that match that criteria. And we opened the position the Mondays 
following the, previous, the expiration. We ran the spreads to the expiration two weeks away with no stops or management. But taking the $100,000 account, we only allocated 6.6% of that total portfolio value into the top three trades, which means only 20%, roughly $20,000, of that whole portfolio was ever allocated to credit spreads. Now the end results, the account value, using the trades that would have matched the criteria on power options for the bull put weekly screen on December 29th was $109,986. And you can say, wait, that's only a 10% return. You're right. It's a 10% return on the full $100,000. But remember, we only allocated $20,000 to spread trades. The highest mark would have been $125,300 or so on October 1st. That makes sense, right? Right before October 4th or 3rd, when it started to decline and then hit November and then hit December, would have given a lot back during that time frame. So at that point, we're at our target, aren't we? 25.4% return for the year, or you could say 126.9% on the $20,000. You made $25,400 on $20,000 essentially. Now the lowest mark, believe it or not, was not at the end of the year, after October, November, December. It was on February 20th, after the February 5th through 9th volatility collapse. Well, the volatility didn't collapse, the volatility spiked, but the volatility effect from February 5th through 9th the account went down to $92,000. It was roughly a 7.8% loss or a 40% loss because it was 7,800 or so on the $20,000 that was allocated. So why would we only use 20% of our portfolio in spread positions? Well, it's because of this. If I had allocated the full $100,000 at one point, I would have been down to $60,000 or less because of improper position sizing on February 20th. Now, sure, I would have had a much higher return on October 1st, but remember the wild swings we saw earlier if you were only looking for a 70 or 75% probability. We saw steep declines of 87%. You only have $13,000 left to invest in spreads. It's going to be much harder to get back to $100,000. That's why in spread trades, we typically do not want to look at more than maybe 15% of our total portfolio, 20% of our total portfolio allocated to spread positions. I use this as a benchmark because we actually discussed this last year at the beginning of 2018 at the end of 2017. That criteria I mentioned, that's the default bull put weekly and power options, was the highest success rate we saw over a two and three year period if you just entered credit spreads and of course, no stops and no management. We look for an expiration time frame of eight to 17 days out. We look to be at least 3% out of the money and we want a strike difference of actually greater than two strikes or two points or higher. It's actually dangerous to use one point spreads or lower over time. We look for that 85% probability. We look for stocks in an uptrend and other technical indicators, and we always avoid stocks that have an earnings date between now and expiration. But there's that 85% probability. It looks familiar. Did it meet the targets? If those positions were open every two weeks, Starting on January 1st, we would have seen that 88% success rate. We had an average of 15.1% on the winners, because we're looking only two weeks out in time instead of 30 days. And with no management, we did average 88% of the loss on the investment into the spread. But we only lost 12% of the time, or nine losses in 74 trades. Now, this is much higher than that 65% we looked at in the simulation. But 
that was the historical testing results if we'd open the spreads that match that search criteria every two weeks in 2018. Let's take those same search criteria. Same time frame, 8 to 17 days out in time to expiration, January 1st, 2018 to December 29th. Same stock settings in an uptrend, avoiding earnings, same allocation, $20,000, roughly 20% of the $100,000 account, even distribution between the top three trades. But let's look for a lower probability, only the 70 to 75% range in that 33% return range. Total account on December 29th was valued at $82,747. It was a loss over the same time frame of $17,250 or 17.3% on the portfolio or 86% of the $20,000 we allocated to spread trades. The highest mark in the first month, January 29th, before that February crash, was $112,350, 12.4% return, or you could say 61.8% on the $20,000 that was being allocated. Interestingly enough, the lowest mark occurred on August 20th before October, November, and December. Made a lot of it back, it looks like, going into September leading up to October 3rd or 4th. But the lowest mark was $67,879, 32.2% loss on the $100,000 portfolio. Or is it 160%? and lost about $32,200. We were investing only $20,000, which means we're either out of trading because we burned through that 20K we allocated, or we had to borrow from the rest of our portfolio and other strategies we might be using in order to try to get back to break even on this losing approach. That's very interesting. Why is this so much worse? Well, the average return on the winners in that 70 to 75% range was 31.2%. It's close to that 33% we were talking about, 36% target we saw. But the average on the losses was 94.4%. Why is it so high? Why would we let it go so high? Is because even with the stops, a trigger to close out the position, the declines were too fast. Spreads would have hit potentially an 85 to 95% loss at market open on February 5th, February 6th, in that two-day time frame, maybe before the trigger was hit. Now, the win ratio, using the same criteria that was successful with an 85% or higher probability, but looking at the 70 to 75%, we hit the win ratio we wanted. 73% winners on 71 total trades, 52 wins and 19 losses but those losses were at 94.4%. So even though we only had a three to one or four to one loss, each loss we're taking was wiping out, as you can see, more than three trades. And we're under a three to one, we're right about a three to one ratio. Now here's the trick. We'd have to use a stop to minimize these losses, but a lot of times it wouldn't have it would have broken right through that stop where the stop or the contingent order in your portfolio at your broker would have been triggered and you would have gotten out at 90, 92% losses as it blew through both strike prices. If I did use a stop, ran the same test but used a stop at the short strike price, the losses were mitigated to maybe only 51, 52% average on the losers instead of 94. That's what I should be targeting but it lowered the win ratio down to 66% because other spreads moved down and hit that put strike price, but then recovered and moved back up and actually became winners. But because of the stop, we were out of them before they could go back up and become winners again. And we saw earlier what happens when you need a target of 73% or 72%, 
but you only get 66% winners. You have a much larger loss in the portfolio. You would have borrowed from other strategies you allocated to in order to try to get back to break even, and you never would have made it. You would have lost more than you allocated in your portfolio. But let's talk about that. Let's look again at the market. Broad market indicator, just looking at SPY, why were the stops not as effective as we would hope? And it's, again, because those declines were too steep. On February 5th, taking a reversal there, two of the three bull put spreads that would have been open during that cycle hit a 98.9% .9 loss at the open. I know that because I was in those three trades following the bull put weekly screens. The same thing happened in the first few days of October, October 8th or 9th, I believe it was. Then we saw it again happen quickly in November. It started to decline and move against us. We probably would have tried to roll or adjust those positions before, but if we just missed it there in middle of November, it broke through, dropped down again, and probably would have put us below both strike prices it was hovering near it, only to recover again a few days later, and then straight down one more time. The losses weren't as bad in March. You know, they were about 60% of the bull put spread positions, 60% of what you invest in the bull puts instead of the 90% or 95 But those quick movements from February 5th through 9th, beginning of October into November, kind of around the end of June was a little bit of surprise too um, as far as the severity of the decline went. And that's why even with the stops, it wasn't as effective as we'd hope to turn a losing trade into a winning trade. Looking for that lower probability and that higher return actually isn't successful long term. Unless you really get it right 75, 78, maybe 80% of the time. Looking for a higher probability of 85% with a lower return actually seems to be the right structure and maybe even a sweet spot for these positions. So we see the structure we want and the win ratio we need. Well, if we have that, and if we've just shown that being right 85% of the time and taking an average win of 15% and allowing the average loss to be even as high as 88%, we could be successful, do I need to even worry about the stock trends? Do I really need to worry about the stocks at all can I just go out and open spreads on any position that have an 85% probability and an average return of 15% and expect to be successful? Let's take our benchmark. Let's take that winning bull put spread criteria. Same expiration, 8 to 17 days out in time. Same probability, 85% or higher. Same strike difference and the exact same time frame. But we're going to remove all the stock criteria we're not going to look for stocks in an uptrend. We're not going to look for stocks that have a positive MACD crossover that we have set into our search. And we're going to ignore if earnings are around or not. We're just not going to care because we've got the 85% probability. Do we need anything else? At the end, same allocation, same time frame, looking at spread positions, had the 85% probability with no stock criteria, the ending amount was $70,844, a loss of $29,166. The success rate was 76%. That is not going to cut it when you're looking for that ratio of going at 85% or higher. We saw we needed to be right about 82, 83% of the time. Now, 59 wins, 19 losses. Still a winning track record, but you're down 29.2%, 30%. Or is it 146% considering you're down 29166 but you only were allocating $20,000 to begin with? In that first month, it did hit a high mark of about a 9.3% gain or 46.3%, almost 50% gain that we saw at the end of the other historical test. The lowest mark did occur at the end, and that is the same structure criteria that gave us successful spread trades but without looking at the stock trend. No stock criteria. So yes, the stock trend is important with the proper 
option criteria as well to be successful. And let's review all these numbers. We saw that that 85% probability with the stock trend was a winning track record. Looking for the higher probability with two times the return, the average of a 31.2% return instead of 15% with the stock trend lost. And using that winning one, but taking out the stock trend also lost as did taking the 73% probability and trying to put in a stop. But of course, the most successful would taking that 85% probability search, but using a stop if the stock hits the short put strike price. That lowers the win ratio down to 83%, 66 wins and 14 losses over 80 trades. But the ending over that same time frame, January 1st, 2018 to December 29th, 2018 was $114,800, 14.8% return, or we could say a 74% return on the $20,000 that was allocated in that portfolio. Uh, the average gain, of course, on the winners was 14.9%, and using that stopped, even though we lowered the win ratio, we also lowered the average loss to 51.1%. If I tried to lower that further, to only take, let's say, a 30% loss on what was invested, my win ratio drops down below 76% again, and I can't be successful I'm looking for spreads with the 85% probability because I still need to be right 82% of the time in order to profit. It lowers a little bit to about 80, but you still need to be right that range, even cutting the losses at 30% because you lower the winners as well and you increase the number of times you lose. So you have to give it some room, but not too much room. <laughs> but that would have been the most successful. But what's interesting here is that structure of the 73% probability, 70 to 75% probability with a 30% return, would have lost in 2018. And at the same time, even if you used a stop, it's still would have been negative. Even if you tried to cut the losses to only 50%, you still would have had a losing performance in 2018. That's why we talk about this benchmark. That's why we use this default in the Power Options screen. And that's, of course, why we look for the 85% probability. Now, was this presentation really beyond the basics? Well, yes, I think. I didn't go into the arcane terms of delta hedging, delta neutral, gamma, decay, implied volatility, implied volatility ratios, IV rank and IV percentage. But what I think I have shown with the evidence of backtesting is that the proper probability range to look for is 85% or higher on your spreads. We talked about what should B, realistic expectations of your portfolio and the proper allocation for success. We looked at the effects of, well, if I've been doing good here with an average of a 15% return, wouldn't I do better if I look for spreads that had twice the average win ratio? We showed that you wouldn't. That increasing the return and lowering the probability is not necessarily a recipe for success. We showed the effects of stops and triggers which they do help in the right structure, but they don't help as we may have hoped in a losing structure. It didn't turn the losing structure into a winning structure. It was still behind. And we showed that even bull puts can be successful in choppy markets where six out of the 12 months were negative market performance. So it's beyond the basics of what is the structure of a bull put in a bear call because what we wanted to show right now is how would you actually put this into your portfolio to work for you and what are realistic expectations and what should you look for to be successful on a more regular basis and longer term over time. So with all this great info, why did I postpone the webinar we were going to show last Wednesday? to post it today because there's a catch and it's an interesting one at that. We talked about bull puts and that even bull puts could have been successful 
in 2018, even though six out of the 12 months were negative market performance. And at the end, at December 29th to even January 1st, 2019, we were below where we started on January 1st, 2018. So that would mean that bear calls did better. Actually, it doesn't. I've been having a very hard time finding a consistently successful bear call credit spread criteria through multiple strategy tests and back test cycles. The same criteria that works so well for bull put spreads, that 85% probability, avoiding earnings, looking for stocks in the downtrend, as well as using MACD and other negative fundamentals and avoiding stocks that had an earnings between now and expiration was not successful at all. Even going up to 90% probability was not successful. And it's because of the cycles. Because you see positions where you could have made profits on bear calls, February 5th to 9th, all three of your bear calls would have profited. But from February 9th to essentially the end of February, you would have lost on three trades. And you would have made on three trades on March 21 to April 5th. And then you would have lost on most of the bear call spreads 75% of the time from May all the way out to October. Roughly six months of losing two or even three out of three times, two out of three or three out of three times with the bear calls. A little success in June, but then even losing, even with the 85 to 90% probability and range out of the money. And then, yes, you would have had a successful October to December, but then a bad January. We're not talking about that January. And it was the cycles that hurt that the market wanted to be kind of bullish and was up until October. And it was more bullish than bearish, even though there were sudden moves to the downside. We couldn't see consistent profits with what we thought would work normally for bear call spreads. Maybe we should look at bear calls on inverse ETFs which might have been profitable even though we would have had losses February 5th to 9th at the end of June and in October and November, even doing bear calls because we were doing inverse ETS. That might be a possibility. But that's what we're going to cover on Thursday. Later on this week, a few days from now, what we're going to take a look at on Thursday, of course, uh, January 24th at 12 noon, we're going to look at going a little bit into beyond the basics for bear call credit spreads. And that's what we want to discuss then. Now remember, this is what is available at Power Options. Not just the education, not just the webinars, and we back up what we teach and back up what we preach using the historical testing and trading these strategies that we teach in our personal accounts. But it's also the tools to find the best trades and default criteria for you to use as a stepping stone based on the education that we've shown us to successful and powerful portfolio tools to manage your positions. If you have not done so already, you want to go over to poweropt.com. Just put in your name and email address and start your free trial. No credit card is needed. You can immediately start to see how these tools can help you save time with your options research and analysis. I hope you got some useful information out of this little presentation we put together for you. Again, you can go to powerop.com and you can click on the webinars view there to not only look at our historical webinars, but to register for Thursday's presentation at 12 noon Eastern time. We're going to take a look at what happened with some of these bear call spread ideas in 2018 and why they weren't successful and take a look a little bit more at beyond the basics to see how to put this to work for you in a portion of your portfolio going on and continuing into 2019. Take care, ladies and gentlemen. We will see you soon.